Director of Professional Development at Gender Spectrum, Joel Baum facilitates trainings, conducts workshops, develops curriculum, consults with parents and professionals, and provides resources in service of a more compassionate understanding of gender and young people. He has served in a leadership role as a Director of Education and Advocacy with the Child and Adolescent Gender Center at UCSF Benioff Children's Hospital. An aspect of his job that he enjoys greatly is working throughout the United States and beyond to help institutions think more expansively about the gender diversity of all children and teens and ways to create more inclusive conditions accordingly. Joel has worked as an educator focused on issues of social justice and equity for over 30 years. His education career began as a middle school science teacher and school administrator. He has also served as a district admin in Oakland, California, a school reform coach with the National Equity Project, and a professor at California State University, Eats Bay, in the Department of Educational Leadership. Please join me in a really warm welcome for Joel Baum. Thank you, Charlene. Um, welcome. It's great to see everyone. So that is indeed me. I'm the Senior Director for Professional Development at Gender Spectrum, and I'll tell you a little bit about Gender Spectrum here in just a minute. Um, but I wanted to kind of give you a sense of the evening. Um, I'm going to be uh, presenting a little bit about sort of a little bit about gender, a little more about sort of how schools can can proactively incorporate notions of gender into their uh, everyday operations. Um, and I'm hoping that this will be a very participatory uh, evening. Um, there will be multiple opportunities for you to talk amongst yourselves, um, ideally in pairs or small groups. Some of us don't like to do that kind of thing. We don't like the pair-share concept, and that's perfectly fine as well. If, you're ha if you happen to be sitting by yourself or if you're even sitting with others but don't want to do that, just talk quietly to yourself. That's perfectly acceptable. <laughs> just, you know. I like to joke, I, I went to school in Berkeley, and uh, there used to be a sign in a place called Bongo Burger um, that had this, I mean, this many years ago, said, no talking to invisible people. And I realized, like, that sign no longer works, because all of us are half the time just talking, and we don't know who we're talking, but we're usually talking to some Bluetooth thing, but it appears invisible people are everywhere. So, anyway, that said, um, I'm actually going to ask you to um, get us started this evening. Gender's everywhere these days. I mean, if you read the papers, if you, you know, turn on the TV, you are seeing subjects about gender everywhere. Our young people are talking about it in lots of ways. How is it showing up for you? What are some things that you've noticed or wondered um, when it comes to gender in your own life? So that could be questions you may have, experiences you've had, but let's just sort of dig into kind of what your uh, uh, kind of starting point is, um, and then we'll maybe share out a little bit, and then we'll, we'll dive in. So please, Aunt Yama, I'll bring a little chime when it's ready to, when I'm ready to have you come back, and we'll go from there. All right, thanks. Thank you. So I just met Andrea, she's a teacher, and I think what I've learned through my child, who is 11, um, and non-binary, is um, it's really hard for kids to be in a classroom or in a school environment when the teachers aren't respecting them. And it's just heartbreaking when the child goes by a different name or a different pronoun and the teachers don't respect that. Yeah. And I feel like that is so important for all of our kids. Yeah. And so again, just if I can re repeat and please correct me if I don't get it right. Um, the Cindy will share how, um, from their own perspective of, of their own child who identifies as non-binary, just how, and in sharing with, with a teacher, how destructive it can be when a young person doesn't feel seen and isn't respected, when they have a name perhaps that isn't listed on the roster, um, or a pronoun that's maybe different than what is ex quote unquote expected, and when that isn't used, how damaging that can be. And I just will reiterate, um, in many cases, when a young person takes the risk and makes that request to an educator or to really any adult, and then it's not um, supported, it's like doubling down on that young person because here they've taken the risk and said, so I think you're safe enough to tell that this is what I need and to have the response be, oh no, I'm not gonna do that. It's not only not supportive, it's actually kind of hostile for the young person and really, really damaging. 
Hi, welcome. Welcome to those of you just joining us. Um, anyone else want to maybe share a perspective, a thought? Yeah, thank you. Just to clarify, um, the parents of the child were on board, that's who you're referring to? Okay, yeah, yeah. So again, the comment was working at a preschool, a very young kiddo who um, was assigned the sex of a boy or male when they were born, but it's told the class, I am a girl, and curiosity about how that would go, especially you know if the parent wasn't on board, which in this case, fortunately, they were. Um, and the reason I asked uh, was which set of parents you were wondering about, because often that question comes up. It's like, even if we want to support this child who, you know, when they registered was named Frederick and is saying, I want to be called Frida, um, how will the rest of the community respond to? But it sounds like you had a, a successful experience with that. Great. So far. Yeah, so far. Maybe one more? Yeah, thank you. Um, Charlene, thanks. We were just talking about how much we've noticed that gender pronouns are becoming very important Yeah, these pronouns are everywhere. I, I got a wonderful email today from someone who's like, I teach foreign language. And the whole idea of pronouns in different languages is really challenged, challenging, especially in languages that are particularly ja challenged, uh, to particularly um, gender, right? And, and for instance, I may get this wrong, but I believe in French, the word bridge is feminine, but in German, bridge is masculine. And from there, other way around. Thank you. I knew someone was going to correct me. Um, clearly not taught science, not language. Um, barely speak English, so like myself. So, um, yeah. But the point being, in these gendered languages, it gets really challenging. And then pronouns. Right? We have some languages that don't use pronouns at all. Others that have a little bit of more flexibility, and some that are you know, the whole language is based on these binary notions. And so, yeah, language is a powerful, powerful part of that. Yeah. Thank you. And again, I'm not going to try to repeat all that, but language class being a, a location where a lot of this really came to life, and I appreciate your observation that over the years, the degree to which that's become front and center, and I would surmise the, the level of comfort the students themselves even have with the concept. I think you said moving from laughter and like wondering to like, oh yeah, of course, um, as part of that.
if you're interested, because I did get this email from this foreign language teacher, I did a little research, there's some really interesting pieces out there. You may know more than me, I mean, have more than I, so maybe I could get them from you. But if you're interested, I actually just came across like five really cool articles, kind of navigating world languages and how the world languages are trying to, trying to deal with that, so. Well, good, well, thank you. And again, there will be multiple opportunities for us to talk tonight, um, but I do want to say a little bit more about my own background. Um, again, my name's Joel, and, and my pronouns are he, him, and his, and as Charlene mentioned, my background primarily, professionally, has been in education in various roles, but my biggest um, role is father. I'm, I'm a dad to two, two girls. I have an 18-year-old who is in her first year of college, um, and a 12-year-old who is in seventh grade and is actually the most grown-up person in our whole family. Um, but uh, just to say, I mean, a lot of the work I do um, is playing out right in front of me in, in their lives. And sometimes I joke, and um, maybe, maybe it'll come up later, but that, that they can't even actually believe this is my job. They really can't. Like, I just was in Florida and came back last night, and as I was getting ready to go, my daughter's like, really? You gotta go all the way to Florida to help people understand about gender? It's like, what is there to get? Like, I just don't get it, like, really. So, it is very interesting. Um, what I can tell you is as an organization, we believe there still is something to get. And so our mission is, is to work towards what we call gender inclusion. Um, and that's for all children and youth. Um, we do that work in a lot of different ways. In addition to uh, the professional development work we do, we have a number of other things that we do. We have um, uh, online programming for both parents and caregivers as well as a ton of different ones for youth. We do some direct services to parents and caregivers through groups. We hold a conference and symposium every summer. I've had a couple people already come up and say they, they've been to those. Um, those are pretty amazing. And then we do a lot of professional development. And when it comes to schools, we've been doing it for quite a while. This is my 12th year at Gender Spectrum. And we've been really, really privileged over many, many years to do this work in a lot of different places. And I really do believe that we've contributed to alert the learning of the places that we've worked. But what I can also tell you is they've definitely contributed to our learning. And in particular, there are three really critical principles that we've sort of learned, maybe a little bit even the hard way, that we have to pay attention to in this work. And the first is just how important it is to simply meet people where they are when it comes to this subject. Now, from from some of the, the comments and laughter in the room, it seems like there's a real comfort with, with this topic among at least many of us. But that isn't so for everyone. And this is a topic that for some is very loaded, very personal, and can often be very controversial. Some people are excited, some are a little nervous, and some are not down. And so we believe that it would be really easy to sit in judgment from our very you know, lofty, knowledgeable, self-righteous place here in the Bay Area um, about this topic, but no, of course, it's, that's not helpful, right? You don't learn, you don't open your mind when people sit in judgment of you, and so far be it from us to do this. Um, when it comes to gender, we've had the experiences we've had, we've learned what we've learned, and so I like to think from the perspective of it's okay not to know, but once you know, you can't not know. And then what do you want to do about it, right? And that's really the work that we're involved with. We try to help people think a little bit more broadly about gender and then think about the implications. We also have to recognize that gender is very intersectional. Gender as a concept is one thing. But as soon as we start talking about the lived experience, we better account for things like culture and language, right, we've already talked about. Race, religion, region, you know, when we've lived. Um, all of these aspects of identity significantly impact a young person's gender. It doesn't change their gender per se, but it changes how that gender plays out. And we better pay attention to that or we're dead in the water. And then the last thing, and we've already alluded to it a couple times, but this work is about all kids. If an alien were to visit this planet and read the news or you know, listen to podcasts about gender, they would think the only people with gender are transgender children. And not only that, apparently all they do is go to the bathroom. They just go to the bathroom and come out. Because it seems to be so much of what we're talking about. Now as a former custodian, I would rather not talk about bathrooms.
mountains anymore, but I spend a lot of time doing that. I want to be very clear. Transgender, non-binary kids, gender diverse young people absolutely face some very real and significant challenges. Gender impacts all of our young people. Some girls like superheroes, some girls like princesses. Some boys like superheroes, some girl, some boys like princesses. Absolutely. Yeah, I think old girls have to like buy stuff and old boys have to buy different color stuff. That's a good question, Riley. gender impacts all of our kids. And tonight is not really a gender training per se, but what we're going to talk about is ways in which schools can in fact be very intentional in how they apply concepts of gender, what we sometimes refer to as gender literacy, to the work of schools, um, but in a way that isn't just about solving a problem or putting out fires but in fact a way that is about school culture and climate and actually creating better learning conditions not just for some kids but for all kids but it starts from a recognition that make no mistake about it every young person is now having to think about gender in different ways and account for it that doesn't mean it's a, a negative thing even necessarily but it is ever present for all of our kids so I want to talk about what we mean by a gender inclusive school and start by talking about why they're so important. talking about a school in which young people actually feel like they are recognized because it does not feel good as one of our parents here shared to not feel seen to not feel recognized and so when we talk about being gender inclusive we're talking about schools that are taking very specific steps it's about intentionality and making sure that every young person really feels seen really feels safe and really feels supported um, in this area. And essentially, gender inclusive schools are answering this question How do we account for the unique gender of every child? Now, over the years, as I said, we've worked with lots of schools, and what's fallen out of that work is a pattern. And that pattern is that this work really falls into four buckets, right? That it isn't enough to just say, You should be gender inclusive, let us know how it goes, right? Um, I mean, I know, Chuck, this is the only thing, gender, that you deal with every day in school. You have no other irons in the fire. You're just waiting for gender questions. Schools are really busy places. They, in California in particular, we're asking our educators to do way more than we give them the time or the resources to do. 
And so the only way we can actually make inroads is if we're strategic. And what we've seen is that being strategic means thinking about sort of what we call four entry points or approaches for doing this work. Um, and what I want to do tonight is really talk about those different entry points. Um, and, and then as we do that, share some examples of what it looks like, ask you to think about your own experiences um, in that entry point, and then, then go from there. Okay? The first entry point, I will say, just to be clear, these are the four entry points, internal, interpersonal, instructional, and institutional. And each of those plays a really critical role in sort of the overall level of inclusiveness, okay? The internal entry point really refers to this notion of what gender is? What do you know about gender? How has gender impacted your own life, your own experiences? What just is gender? Why do we laugh when we talk about gender reveal parties? Well, really, genitalia reveal parties. And like, what, why does that matter? Why do we need to know? Now, what I want to do is start by talking about, very briefly, the model of gender that we use. This is typically about a 75-minute or 90-minute training, but I want to just give you some of the highlights of it, because part of it is, this entry point is, what do you know about gender? To be clear, what I want to share is not something that we just kind of whipped up, you know, over in Emeryville, which is where our office is. This is a model of gender that's recognized and endorsed by virtually every professional association in the country and the world, really. This slide happens to be a more school-based one, but I have another slide that looks at you know, virtually every medical, mental health, child welfare, legal, um, you know, juvenile justice. I mean, this is how people think about gender. And in this model of gender, there's three ideas. To understand gender, we first have to recognize Gender is not just about your body. It, in fact, it isn't revealed at a pink and blue gender reveal party. Gender incorporates body, identity, and this whole social dimension. And only when we think about the three of those and how they all fit together can we begin to really get a picture of gender. <laughs> These three dimensions also are very much in, in relationship with one another. All of us want to feel balance across these three dimensions. Because to be clear, we all have an identity, we all have a body, and we all exist in a context. Within those three, we're looking for a level of harmony that we refer to as congruence. Secondly, when it comes to each of these dimensions, each one is not binary, boy, girl, man, woman, A, B, night, day but complex, an incredible level of variation and diversity. Very quickly, the body, as I mentioned, sometimes refers to our anatomy, uh, includes our anatomy as well as how we experience our body. Our identity is the deeply held internal sense of self, as well as the label that we use to communicate that. And the social dimension is then how those things show up both how we show up and how the world then responds to us in, each of, in, in, in those, okay? I want to let you know that here in California, the education code is completely aligned with this. Gender is a protected category in California. Many of the questions, for instance, in Florida or other places we go, the bathroom thing, that's not even a question here. The law is abundantly clear about expectations regarding this topic. But I also, also like to point out, look at the definition of gender, right? Sex, the body part, identity, and expression, the social part. Three dimensions. And whether or not stereotypically associated with sex assigned at birth, okay? So of course, when someone has a baby, this is the first question, right? What do you have? And the answer is generally made based on the body. So as I said, the genitalia reveal party, you know, I want you to think about that scene in the movie when, when a person has a baby and they hand the, the baby over to the parent and they say, you've had a beautiful baby, let's say boy, right? Well, what they really know is your baby has a penis and here you go, hopefully healthy, 10 toes, 10 fingers. I did this once, I'm like five toes, five, wait, no, no, that's not, 10 toes, 10 fingers. But really, what we do is we assign the sex. 
right? We put this label on, and then we presume the gender. Well, this is what the gender binary is all about. That's our system of gender that we operate from, okay? But what we have to recognize is that while that system works for many of us, it doesn't work for everyone. Many of us were assigned a particular sex and were said to be a particular gender, and that's been our truth. For some, it's not. It's not better or worse, it's just not absolute. But the gender binary ends up excluding people, okay? And it's based on these two assumptions. A, that there are only two bodies, and B, one body is always boy, the other body is always girl. Well, first of all, there aren't just two bodies. To begin with, these two so-called typical bodies are unbelievably complex. And I won't get into that tonight, but believe me, it's amazing how complex, quote unquote, typical sex is. It's by no means two versions. There's so much going on. But as I said, there's also a third category. That is, most bodies have male traits or female traits, and some bodies don't, and have intersex traits. And when we're talking about the language of gender, we're really talking about moving from either or thinking to both and thinking. This is not about getting rid of gender. It's not about saying gender doesn't matter. We cannot say the word boy or girl. It's just there's more to it than that. And we want to be much more nuanced in that conversation, okay? Identity is how you, what you know to be your truth. Once more, in a binary model, you're a boy or a girl. You're a man or a woman. But what we're coming to recognize is that, in fact, there are many, many different ways that people identify. Many, many different terms that people use to describe this internal experience that they're having. And once again, boy may work for some of us. Girl may work for a lot of us. And then it may not. And what we're talking about is I coming up with a language that captures the experience that is true for you, okay? And finally, there's the social dimension. We have typically masculine things and typically feminine things, but really, those are stereotypes that change all the time over history. 100 years ago, pink was the boy color. So a gender reveal party 100 years ago would have looked very, very different than one today. But that's changed over time. And I'm sure we can all think of examples, hair length, professions, um, stay-at-home dads, you know, women running for presidents. Oh, we won't even go there. A lot, of, um, a lot of things have shifted over time when it comes to uh, the, the social dimension. And it is a constantly moving target, okay? So we have to account for all three of these dimensions. And as I mentioned, they interact. One way they might interact is like this. A person might be born with what we might describe as a female body, and she may identify as a girl or a woman. Similarly over here, the expression will frequently, though not always, sort of follow a typical pattern. And we might describe this individual, and it's hard to see if they're cisgender. How many of you are familiar with the word cisgender? Okay, most of the hands going up, that's great. Don't worry if you're not, because it was only added to the dictionary fairly recently. But cisgender means literally a person whose assigned sex and identity are aligned. They line up. The prefix cis literally needs to be on the same side. So literally, the body and the identity are on the same side. Okay? Here's another way to be cisgender, though, of course, which is you can be assigned the sex of a female, identify as a girl or a woman, but do things that are supposedly more typically masculine. And of course, what does that young girl sometimes refer to as? Tomboy, right? Tomboy's an interesting title. Anyone in here ever deemed a tomboy? Okay, keep your hand up if you were called a tomboy at some point. If that was either a relatively positive title for you or a sort of neutral one? Positive, okay. Keep that, put your hands down. Raise your hand if that title was a negative thing. Okay, definitely, in some cases, okay. We also have this little kid, this kiddo, who's assigned sex with male, and he identifies as boy or man. 
but he does quote unquote girly things. What do we call him? Sissy. Sissy? Right? What else? You're being very polite. <laughs> right? We know what this kid often gets called. Pussy. Right? And we don't have really a word like tomboy for him. Well, a lot of people will be like, yeah, tomboy, awesome. Don't have a lot of families talking about, yes, my little sissy. Wow, I'm just so... We don't talk about that kid at all the same way. And yet, what's the difference between him and her? It's not a lot, except this, this expression, this social dimension, which is completely constructed anyway. But we do know they have very different experiences. Okay? Then, of course, we can have kids who are assigned one sex and identify as the other. And that person might be called a transgender boy in this very binary way of thinking. The social dimension might look like many number of different things, and in many cases, this kiddo isn't even going to call himself transgender. He's just a boy who happens to have a body that's not necessarily like many of the other boys. Similarly, a transgender girl might be described this way. And finally, we have this whole world of non-binary identities. Okay? And we're talking about identities that are neither one nor the other. And what's really important to recognize about these identities, um, and again, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, is that these are not new. Non-binary identities have existed throughout history in cultures all over the world. It's not an invention of the internet. It is something that, in fact, has existed forever, right? And in most cases, individuals who were deemed non-binary in the language of their cultures were often held in very high regard by the societies in which they found themselves. In our own state, we've now begun to formally recognize this through identity documents. You can now get an X on your driver's license to indicate a non-binary identity. And we join many states and countries in that formal recognition, okay? The last thing, and, and so suddenly non-binary gender identities can look a little more complicated than those pictures. So if you think about it, when it comes to gender literacy, we started here, right? Gender reveal party, right? Well, not really. And we ended here. And I will definitely agree, it's a little bit more complex. <laughs> There's a lot more to it, but it's not all that complicated. And what being gender literate about is recognizing, what, what being gender literate is about is recognizing there's just no one truth. And that even if I use the same word as another person, I call myself a boy or a man, I'm not really telling you a whole lot, right? I'm not even telling you what my body is, because I could be transgender, but simply call myself a boy, or I could be non-binary, but you don't know what's going on with my body or what I'm sharing with you or how I dress or what my interests are. Again, it's about being curious. And really, at the end of the day, you do you, I'll do me. I don't need to tell other people who they are. You know your experience better than I do, etc. Okay? So, the other thing we have to make sure we recognize in this model is gender and sexual orientation are different. This is the third part of this model, and the reason we have to do that is because we frequently use various gender clues or gender cues and make decisions about other people's sexual orientation. And so we look at what someone wears, or what a child wants to be, you know, play with, or, or, you know, how someone behaves, and assume we know something about their sexual orientation. And they're not the same. Finally, some other big ideas. Gender is about all of us. Everyone's impacted. Attitudes are changing fast, especially among young people. And the language is shifting right along with it. One of the things I was just talking with uh, an educator in, uh, across the Bay, and they're trying to get their school to do some work, and, and she was talking about how hard it is because people are so scared to say the wrong thing, right? I'm going to make someone feel uncomfortable. I'm going to reveal ignorance. I'm just going to kind of embarrass myself, right? I, I just don't want to draw attention to this. And I like to reassure, reassure people on that score, don't worry about it. You absolutely will say the wrong thing. Just let that go. You will. But it's not about having the right answer. It's about having the right question. 
and that's a big part of being gender literate, is adopting the stance of curiosity and wonder. And finally, educators ultimately are protective agents for the young people in their charge, and often maybe the only protective agent in a child's life. And then lastly, buckets of grace for all of us. This is a moving target, and we have to be patient with ourselves and with each other, while at the same time holding very urgently the words that were shared over here about just how much it matters for a young person to be taken seriously and to be seen. And so we better be really careful with those buckets of grace that they don't become crutches of grace. I just made that up, but that's really true, right? We can't be like, well, I'm trying, so sorry if it's hard for you, right? But at the same time, we have to have patience. Okay, how do you work in this area? You learn more about gender. You think about your own gender. You talk to young people about gender. They are definitely ahead of us. Oh, hold on just a minute there, Buster. Dad, I'm supposed to be with Emily in like 10 minutes. I gotta go. Well, we can wait for a little bit, can't you? You have a minute to talk to your old man, don't you? Have a seat. You know, son, you're not a kid anymore. Oh, no. I go to health class, Dad. I already know all this stuff. Well, they don't teach you about everything in health class. Okay, Mr. Smarty Pants? So just listen. When boys and girls get a little older, they start getting interested in one another, right? You know, and non-binary people, agender, intergender, FDX, gender fluid people. What? There's more than just boys and girls now, Dad. And they're not girls. They're women. <laughs> yeah. Okay, sure. Well, my point is that sex is a, it's a very important decision. How are you defining sex? Sex is different things to different people. I guess what, what a penis goes into a vagina? What if there's two men or two women or more? More? But how would you define partners. sex with multiple simultaneous partners? Or what if somebody's undergoing general reconstruction? Or, or is intersex? Uh, no, but I'm just talking about normal, straight. Normal? Come on, Dad. Okay, here we go. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, are you attracted to women? Yes, but I'm, I'm young. Is Emily a woman? Biologically. <sighs> okay, you're attracted to women. Emily's a woman. So if you were to have sex with Emily... I would just have sex with Emily. We'd have to make that decision together. Homecoming's not an excuse to ignore consent. I'm not saying to ignore consent. I never said ignore consent. You and Emily might consensually decide to have sex. Vaginal? Yes, vaginal. Just the two of us. How many people do you want? Yes, just the two of you. Come. And I'm playing the traditional male role. Go to homecoming. You seem like you really wanted to talk about this. I don't want to talk about anything. Come on. So I can go. Please do. All right. 
So just to give you a sense of things, when we do trainings with schools, we do a very similar process talking about these different entry points, but instead of asking them this kind of question, we ask, how are you going to make this come alive in your own space? So for instance, you know, we will give them a list of different things that they can actually do, concrete, discrete actions they can take, and ask them to, again, identify what they're going to do and tell someone. Right? And then we encourage our school leaders and other people who sort of hold the spaces for these conversations to come back to it. And in a very loving and kind way say, so how's it going? Did you manage to read that article? How many of you did talk to someone else about gender? How many of you spent a little time thinking about your own gender, right? And so to really keep that work going, okay? Questions about the internal entry point, about the learning part of gender. Well, I'll vamp for a little while you think about your great questions by saying um, this is one of the areas that's hardest, ironically, to get educators to do, to learn, right? We frequently get calls and say, yeah, 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 we know plenty about gender. We have a lot of gay staff. And so, you know, that's the first clue, like, mm -hmm, okay. Um, just give us the lesson plans. Tell us how to deal with these bathrooms, you know? You've got to do the learning. You have to have the foundation in place so you can truly understand why when a young person raises the question of why you're always saying good morning, ladies and gentlemen, when some of my friends don't identify as either one of those. And why are you using the term lady anyway? That's really not working for a lot of folks, right? I mean, but if you don't understand why that might be problematic and you kind of have, or, you know, they or whatever, it's fine, you know, if you don't understand why those things matter, then lesson plans aren't going to get you very far because you're going to end up tripping all over yourself and actually probably doing a little more damage than, than not, right? This really is, falls out of the category of a little knowledge is dangerous. We want to make sure schools give themselves the time to be learners, to, to have curiosity, to have wonder, because if they don't, then, it, you know, we end up setting the work back. So any, other, any questions? Yes, thank you. So what would you say for something like the um, fifth grade outdoor ed, right? So outdoor ed has all their cabins assigned, and a lot of kids have anxiety about going to outdoor ed in the first place, and then to think that they're in a cabin, it's fifth grade, they're not going to be. So what are things like kind of at a policy level Yeah, so that, that's a, a, a great question. The question was about um, outdoor ed or field trips or other spaces where kids are shared. I mean, you can extend it to bathrooms and locker rooms as well. So, like when people are, are in what we believe to be these, I don't know, gendered spaces, sex spaces, what are we really talking about, right? Um, what I will say is, again, the law of California makes it really easy. Kids get to go consistent with their identity. I'm a transgender girl, I will be in the girl's other tents if, I, if that's what I want to do. I have a right to do that. Now, the law compels us to do things. It's not very compelling, right? So we need to do better than say, it's the law and that's what we're gonna do. What we recommend is that schools step back a little bit and first of all, don't begin thinking about this on May 12th when the trip is starting on May 15th. Right? You know you do these trips every year. How are you handling rooming? Right? How are you handling the different possibilities for roommates? You know, at the end of the day, what we want in any rooming situation is for kids to be safe, kids to be uh, to feel you know supported, and that's actually not about the bodies. Right? It's about the conduct in those spaces. I can be in a space with other penis-bearing humans just like myself and be made to be very uncomfortable simply by the way that those folks conduct themselves. Another question we get a lot about this spa these spaces, and again, I'm doing kind of a butchered job here because I want to be conscious of time, and I, I'm not, tonight wasn't necessarily about like the individual complicated, and that's, that's an ongoing conversation with the school that we're partnering with. But one of the big questions we get in these situations is, okay, come on, you're gonna put those boys 
that think they're girls with the other girls, and you know what's going to happen in there. They're going to get busy. And I just want to be really clear. You know, anyone can get busy with anyone, right? I and mean, it's like, you don't have to have different bodies for inappropriate conduct to take place. It either does, though, or it doesn't. And by the way, I mean, let's face it, kids want to get busy. They get, I mean, right? Like, hello, you're all young, we know. But they do or they don't, not because I have the same or different body, it's because I know it's not going to fly. I'm going to be having it supervised. I, it's been very clear what the expectations are. I'm going to be you know, knowing that, that if I, there are consequences if I, act in a, if I conduct myself inappropriately. What often comes up is that we confuse safety and comfort, right? So if I'm in a bathroom and there is a transgender person whose body is different than mine, we will frequently hear people say, well, you're all just worried about their safety. What about the safety of the other kids? And I'm like, absolutely. Please tell me how anyone is unsafe at this school. And if your answer is, well, there's just this other person in there, this other person exists, and that makes me unsafe, that's not unsafe, that's uncomfortable. But we need to be able to have options, but we're not going to ask the individual who actually has a legal right to be there to adjust because someone else is unsafe. So I'm doing a poor job in answering that. What we actually ask schools to do is, first of all, get creative. At the beginning of the year, well in advance, you have students told, here are the various options for rooming during this trip. You can be in a, set, in, a, in, a, in a tent with individuals of all genders. You can be in a tent with individuals who um, have just the same kind of body you have. You can be in a tent um, where you can yeah. you don't care. You give them multiple possibilities. And then you mix and match so that you're making sure, in the cases where you know if you have a child whose gender is um, non-binary or not, you know, what everyone thinks it is, that you're not picking the most conservative family who's going to have the biggest problem with that and putting those kids together. In other words, it's about chopping this really large thing into little pieces and then responding to it that way. But I just want to be really clear, um, and you'll see in a minute, actually, this next entry point, all the concerns that get raised about these spaces, they come down to three things, none of which are naked bodies. They come down to options, processes, and school climate, right? And it's in addressing those three things that we have found answers to every single concern that gets raised, along with this idea of being uncomfortable isn't the same as being unsafe. And if you're uncomfortable, we'll give you options. But we're not going to have the options, quote unquote, fall on the backs of young people who are already dealing with a whole bunch of mistreatment and, and oppression. So that's probably not giving you a whole lot. But, but I, just to say, I think there's often this sort of, and that is such a hot button issue, not in your case, because it's a very real question, but it's a sensationalized issue. What we need to do is bring that conversation back down to like, all right, let's talk about the scenarios. I, mean, I love, I love how you their strength. But see, that's different. I mean, that's not about gender then. That's about conduct. And we already have plenty of rules that say you do not get to, in, so, so for instance, when I talk about you don't do this May 12th when the trip's May 13th, right, or whatever. As you get ready for the trip, it's like, okay, folks, we're going to get ready for the point race trip, and you know, we're going to be intense. That's going to be awesome, cold, but awesome. And here's what we're going to do. This is how we're going to do rooming. First of all, we've got lots of different tents and lots of different sizes of tents. Here's how we're going to select roommates. But before we do any of that, we're first going to talk about some expectations for how we're going to be with one another in a space that isn't this classroom. 
we're going to talk about things like boundaries and privacy and personal space and erring on the side of giving people more room rather than less. And a very clear message of, and by the way, there's three of us adults and 60 of you young people, so I'm just going to let you know right now, if you're not able to handle the things here, I hate zero tolerance policies because they end up affecting certain kids. In, but on a camping trip, you violate our expectations, you're going home. Right? So I just want to be really clear, when it comes to modesty, when it comes to personal space, when it comes to um, respecting privacy, here's what we, so again, we actually socialize the kids, and we have a responsibility to do that for every kid, because we don't usually, you know, sleep next to each other, or, you know, maybe change clothes in a tent next to each other, or whatever we have to do, and so we want to be overly clear about our expectations for all kids. And so we're going to talk about, you know, modesty, and when we change clothes, we're going to ask you to, you know, everyone needs to bring a, a pair of sweatpants or something else, or a robe or some other, right? We're going to give them ways, because I can be in a tent with lots of other male-bodied people, and I'm still very uncomfortable, because I'm this scrawny little guy, and that feels weird, and so, in other words, the issues related to some of the questions you're issues, those are real, I and mean, we have to address them, but not because we have different gen different well different sexes in a space as well as you know are we going to be able to say look we have uh kids who don't feel comfortable with a bunch of other boys and so we have or are we going to have some all gender spaces or are we only going to have binaries because now what do your non-binary kids do where do they go well if we have some options then we have a way to account for as many needs as possible okay all right let's dig into the interpersonal the interpersonal is about conversations and language, teachable moments. What these entry points and work in this area is about is providing the counter narrative to the binary. It's helping kids realize, oh, right, so it might not be that I've ever seen boys that like dresses, but that doesn't mean boys can't, right? In other words, moving them from the idea of either or to both and. We like to talk about in this dimension, or in this um, entry point, distinguishing patterns from rules. There are patterns around gender, but they're not absolutes. So if we end up saying, you know, hearing a kid say, oh, girls, why would girls, why are you asking the class about the Super Bowl? None of the girls want to watch the Super Bowl. Huh, that's a really interesting statement. So I'm guessing in your experience, you don't know very many girls who like football. Are there any girls in this classroom who like football? Huh, so maybe in your experience, most girls don't, but that doesn't mean they all don't. And by the way, do you think all boys do? Because I'm guessing there's, right? So both in. This looks like language that we use. Again, I'm going to try to get the word all genders, or cisgender, or non-binary into a sentence. And I'm hoping someone says, what do you mean all genders? You mean both genders, right? Teachable moment. Yeah, a lot of people think there's only two genders, boys and girls. Turns out why a lot of us feel that way, not all of us do. I'm going to think about how I get kids' attention. I'm going to be thinking about how I'm responding to kids. I'm going to be uh, examining messages and stereotypes. I'm going to demonstrate being a work in progress. Which means that I can say to kids, you know what, students in my seventh grade science class, I'm really working on not being gendered. And so I'm trying not to say things like, ladies and gentlemen, you guys, right? But I know I'm going to slip sometimes. So if I do, I want you to call me on it. And secondly, um, you know, I'm going to to myself eventually say, all right, ladies and gentlemen, look at me assuming everyone's a lady or a gentleman. Like, that's all there is to it. Anyway, hey folks, can you get out of your lab reports and we're going to write? I'm going to be very public and it's okay to make mistakes as long as I'm honest and own it, right? And don't trip all over myself, you know, making, you know, particularly around pronouns. This we hear a lot. So let's say I have a student, everyone knows this person goes by they, but I knew this kid because their older brother came here and I knew them when they were he, and I actually referred to them as he, and everyone says, oh, it's they. Now, what we sometimes see people do is get so apologetic. Oh my gosh, I am so sorry. I cannot believe I did that. Listen, you know, 
just, I'm gonna call your parents just to let them know I did this, I feel terrible, right? And now, I've got that young person needing to take care of me. So I've not only misgendered them, now I put it into a position where they now need to take care of me because I'm feeling so bad. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Thank you for the reminder, and I'll be working on that, so let's continue, right? So again, being a work in progress and demonstrating how to gracefully move through these things is part of this work. Um, yeah, these are some examples of possible phrases that can be really, really helpful. Um, let me see what else I can share with you. Um, how we do? Okay, one thing about the boys and girls thing, this is something I always like to share. It's less critical here, but in terms of why should you be careful about boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen? Well, first of all, you are leaving some kids out. So if I say, you know, boys and girls, please take out your homework from last night, I'm gonna have a growing number of kids who are going, oh cool, my homework, I don't have to turn it in. Awesome. Because <laughs> you, you said boys and girls, it's not me. I'm also going to be triggering some kids by constantly referring to boys and girls. I'm also certainly reinforcing the binary by constantly saying boys and girls. And maybe most tellingly, we're gonna have on a growing basis kids saying like, who are, like, what? Recently, actually not so recently anymore, but we had a conversation with the CEO when we were gonna do some work at his little tech company, and one of the things we always ask is like, so how, like I said with you this, this, when we started, how's gender been showing up for you? And he said something like, well, you know, it hasn't really shown up at work, but I was out to lunch recently with my, uh, my son, and, and he's a freshman in college, and I made some statement, I don't know, about pronouns or something about gender, and he put his fork down and he looked at me and said, Dad, you're irrelevant and you don't even know it. <laughs> I knew I needed to learn some gender at that point, right? So this is irrelevant and don't even know it, right? It'd be like telling our students, so listen, when you get ready to write your papers, be sure you have a lot of white out because you're gonna have to correct some of the mistakes you make when you're typing. Like, kid, what? Like, white out? What are you talking about? That does not compute. And it may be appropriate at some time, but the point at the end of the day is be intentional. Why are you feeling like, I have to be able to say boys and girls, good morning, because that's the hill I've chosen to die on today. Okay, know though there are implications, all right? There's some documents we have in something called our Gender Inclusive Schools Toolkit. You can look at those on the website, one of them we've given you tonight but I've been admonished a little, like we don't have a ton of folks with young kids, but some of you have a few. I did want to mention this document to, to the question about sort of these gendered spaces. This one happens to be about bathrooms. But again, it's what we've tried to do here is give, give you um, some really good language. Again, meeting people where they are, respectfully engaging the questions, not being snotty and sarcastic, even though maybe a little here, but um, it really is designed to be like, hey, of course you have questions, so let's deal with them. I was at a training once where the bathroom question did come up and, and someone said, well, okay, I'm off. Well, I'm actually not all that fine with all the gender stuff, but certainly the bathroom, this is many years ago now, we're not gonna let you know boys that think they're girls into the bathrooms with the girls. And I'm like, well, first of all, they are girls, but that's beside the point. What do you, why? Well, you know, I'm like, no, I, I, I don't actually. Could help me understand, like, tell me the scenarios. You know, that you're imagining, what do you imagine happening? And so we went through some, and first of all, to myself, I'm like, man, you are going to some really interesting bathrooms that I am not familiar with at all. But nonetheless, <laughs> nonetheless, let's address each one of those in a reasonable manner. And then we'll point out, and that's what that does. So if you're interested, take a look. I want to make sure I get through all this, so I'm going to ask you to think about that question on your way home tonight. Because I want to make sure I do. Um, but I really do want you to think about how comfortable are you talking about gender, and um, is there a conversation with someone that you're willing to commit to having this month? Yeah. You know, I just wanted to say that we did a conversation, a parent education event about five years ago at Sequoia High School, and we brought in Anthony Ross, who's then director of outlets, I mean, you know Anthony. But I really thought that it was important because in that space with parents, they said, this has been so great. I never get to talk about my child in public. That they had such different expression in terms of what they dressed, how they identified, what their sexuality was, and I thought, the kids are doing better, but I do think that the parents are struggling, and that just having a place
place like this that's safe and we're learning is a great thing. So thank you. Well, thanks. Yeah. And and again, I just want to leave you on this section by. You're gonna get it wrong, don't worry, you know. Practice with someone that's, you know, that maybe you feel a little bit, you know, will, will be less judgmental. Um, you know, in trainings I say, in the, in the Bay Area, we have the saying that if you don't like the weather, wait 10 minutes, right? That's kind of like how language of gender is. You can talk to six kids about seven words and get about 20 different definitions. In other words, this is much more about saying, so I want to talk about gender, and these are some of the things I want to talk about, and I'm going to ask a question, or I'm going to hear it when someone, when my kid comes home and says, or like that kid on the video, right, says, you know, well, you know, what do you mean, are the genital reconstruction surgery, are we doing this or that? It's like, okay, hang on a second. So I heard you say these things. I think that means this, but I'm not totally sure. Is that how you're using it? Because you can have people using words, the exact same words in very different ways. And so when we have any kind of opportunity to say, hold on a second, I just want to make sure I'm following you. I don't want to make assumptions, right? Qualifying what you're about to say with, I don't want to make assumptions. I don't mean to be, I'm not being rude, but I'm really wondering, how are you using that word? Or what does that word mean to you when you use the word, you know, a gender? Or when you use the word gender queer or gender fluid? Can, can you help me understand? I've heard it. I think it might mean this. Is that how you're using it? That is how the dialogues get opened up. And they'll be like, oh my God, that is so 2017. Listen, when I say gender fluid, I mean this. And then now you, the conversation is going. The other piece is to definitely, you know, I mean, share your experience growing up, right? Boy, when I was a kid, there was no way in the world that a kid could do this. Is that still true today? Right? And they may say, yeah, actually, you know, or they might say, really? God, that's terrible. But again, using your experience, you, you can't get your experience wrong, right? You can't, the kid can't say, no, that's not true. It's like, no, really, that was. Like, you know, I mean, a lot of, a lot of my colleagues talk about it. Some of them are a bit older, but talk about, as, as women, what it was like to be told that you don't get to wear pants to school. Or um, someone recently told me, when, again in Florida, she shared this story about, oh no, this was actually up in Mendocino. She shared this story about how she went to this really great school and the teacher though, one of her, her teacher, a male teacher, had one rule about gender, which was once a week, all the girls had to wear dresses. Just once a week. And she was not happy, right? So she told this story about how she refused to do it, she got in trouble, she told her mom, I, I'm not going to do it, and I don't want you, this is fifth grade, I don't want you to deal with it, I will deal with it. So she didn't wear the, the, the overall, or she didn't wear the dress, she wore overalls. She was assigned trash pickup, I have an assistant principal over here, I know, I guess she has assigned this, yep, I have too. All the other girls joined her that day in picking up the trash, and she also shared how many years later, she ran into someone at a restaurant, he said, you probably don't remember me, but I'm so-and-so, and I can remember to this day picking up trash with you, and I just want to think. Like, right? So giving an experience from your own life could be a great starting point. So just think about that. Instructional entry points, just what they sound like, teaching and learning. We can do lessons that are overtly about gender. Pause, we're going to learn about gender, okay, everyone? <laughs> And we can do that at virtually every level, right? Elementary, middle, high school. There's tons of great lessons out there. Um, I want to show you just kind of one example from a fourth grade classroom, what it can look like. We can do lessons about gender, right? And there's lots of them out there, lots of great resources. Um, literature is another great place to be explicitly talking about gender, right? But one of my favorite questions to ask a group of teachers is who needs more to teach? Right? Who doesn't have enough? Who runs out around April 30th? Right? <laughs> Very few are saying, oh yeah, I covered it all. And so what we talk a lot about is integrating gender into the content you're already covering. Right? Writing prompts are a fabulous way that, you know, especially if we think system-wide, that maybe once in fifth grade, once in seventh grade, and once in tenth grade, as a district, we've agreed that one thing we'll do is have students write to these prompts when they're writing a persuasive and a response to literature, etc. Right? Even spelling tests, right? Simple things. 
The word is competitive. She became very competitive when she played football. Competitive. Pageant. He loved designing clothes for the pageant. Pageant. Right? I'm not getting into a gender lesson, but what have I done? Interrupted the binary. Challenged the stereotype. I'm hoping someone says, what do you mean he? Boys don't design clothes. Really? Did you know some of the world's most famous clothing designers are men? Yeah, but anyway, we've got to move on because we've got another few more words. Okay, social studies, another great place where we can do this, right? Looking at stereotypes, looking at gender in different cultures, including the notion of two spirits in, in many native cultures. Talking about issues related to power, right? The whole Me Too movement is based in gender. What's going on there? Let's look at that, let's analyze that. Thanks. Lots of opportunities to once again talk about gender in ways that are not about a lesson about gender, but I'm gonna reference it. I mentioned the, uh, the bathroom document. This is another one we're very proud of. It's about a, a, it's a, some principles for teaching puberty education in a very gender inclusive way. And I know we have at least one science teacher, so I was really excited to share this website. This is a website some science teachers in Colorado have put together. High school teachers who are putting together lessons specifically about gender inclusion. And believe me, they're all over the standards, but they're doing it in a way that's gender inclusive. Okay? In math, lots of things we can do, right? Even if we're doing sample problems, we can use gender as an example and actually make the kids do more calculations. I mean, who doesn't love that, right? You can look at data that has gendered themes, because that's a skill in science. And really, in virtually every other instructional area, you can do things related to gender. This is more in-depth work, obviously. It means working with district curriculum departments, etc. But there are lots of ways that we can weave science, I'm sorry, weave gender, you weave science too, but weave gender into content that we're already covering, okay? And then the last entry point is we have to recognize all of this has to be supported institutionally. There has to be the structures and systems in place that allow this work to really take hold. Many of those are grounded in legal, you know, legal uh, bases. We mentioned the law in California. But the person I talked to today who was, um, you know, uh, over in the East Bay about the situation they're dealing with, she's like, yeah, I know laws are great, but no one does anything. You know, policies are great, but what if we don't do anything different? There's an implementation gap. So what do you do? Well, you begin to get very, very um, intentional. This is a, 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 a sample gender inclusion commitment policy. Now, it's got a lot of words. I get it. But just as you read that, you'll notice this is a clear declaration of intentionality. And you have to, I still believe we're in a world that if you don't say it, the assumption is you don't see it, right? But if you do say it, now I know you do in fact see it, okay? But there are lots of other things too. Signs. The power of a sign on a door, in a classroom, in an office, in a hallway, really says a lot. I get it. Imagery of people transgressing gender norms, super powerful, right? Once more, someone may never, you know, might go years before someone notices that picture of, you know, he can do it, wait, what's going on there? Or, you know, what? Why do you have that picture? Oh, yes, I'm glad you noticed, you know, I just really like to help people see that gender should limit any of us. Images from around the world, we hear all the time, well, you know, certain cultures, they're just not having it. Well, that's kind of a broad statement. You know, there's a lot of gender diversity in the world, too. Societies have looked at gender very differently over history. So I get that some, you know, some cultures that maybe, you know, some context you found yourself in seem to have some patterns. They're not rules, though. They're not absolutes. Facilities, all gender restrooms. You know, it's now the law in California that any um, single stall restroom in a public place has to be all gender. So if you go to a restroom and they have a men's bathroom and a women's bathroom and there's just one commode in each one of those, they're actually in violation of the law. You have to have, make them all gender. 
This was a document called the Gender Support Plan. It's once more a very specific approach for supporting our trans and non-binary kids. Coming back to the tents and the bathrooms and all that, this is a key part of this. Because I need to be able to say to my community, just so you know, we're not flying by the seat of our pants here. We do have processes. We're not just making this stuff up as we go. You know, a question we often get is, what's to prevent some eighth grader from saying, hey coach, <laughs> I'm a girl today, so I'm gonna change the girls' locker room, okay? What do I say, what's to prevent that from happening? Well, one, I'm not an idiot, I'm not dumb. Um, and two, that's not about gender, but I'm gonna say the following. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for sharing that with me. Listen, we're not gonna do the whole locker room thing today. What we're gonna do is head on up to the office and set up a gender support plan, because I'm guessing you have some other things you wanna deal with, like pronouns. Still gonna be what pronoun? Can they use a different name? Well, of course, the kid like, never mind. I'm not an idiot. That doesn't happen that way. Okay, we're not just flying by the seat of our pants. Student uh, identity documents are critical. Dave had transferred to a new district. His former district did nothing about the LGBT bullying he had in Dory. In fact, when Dave reported the bullying to a staff member, the response was that Dave's gender identity, not the bullying, was the problem. The year started well, but substitute teachers were not told about Dave's name. My son was called a distinctly feminine name in a time and a place where no one knew he was transgender. Without his consent, without his permission, without his control, he was outed. Everyone in that class knew. By lunch, the Whisper Network had grown. If we're not able to change a student's name and, identity and, and gender markers in the student information system, that student is at risk. And again, in California, we have a lot of leeway to do that. There's a lot more leeway than most people know. Um, some districts are doing a better job than others. But again, that's a critical institutional practice. Someone mentioned pronouns, right, in your emails. That could be a very institutional practice, right? If we say, listen, if you send an email, we, we do want people to list their pronouns, and here's why, right? Because that signals something to our community. Parent resources, having those available, and again, many, many other ways to demonstrate that you are paying attention to this, okay? The question I want to leave you with is to begin thinking about in what ways are you aware of that your current schools and systems are doing some of these things? And what might you ask about them doing them in the future? I want to come back to that essential question that we encourage everyone to ask, teachers, kids, parents of a school, if you're interested in getting this work going. And to do so with seriousness, without arrogance or anything, which is, I'm really curious, how are we accounting for every student's gender here at our school? Right? Not how are we dealing with our trans kids, what's up with the bathrooms, how are we accounting for gender around here? What are we doing to really be, you know, well, first of all, to not be irrelevant, to not even know it, but in all that, like, how are we doing? I'm just curious, what are some of the things we're doing differently because we know gender is really changing, or the way we're talking about it anyway. What are we doing around here about that? I'm curious to hear. Not in a challenging way, but in a way that says, I can't wait to hear all the things we're doing, or, oh, okay, I'm wondering, have you thought about doing some stuff? Have you done any training yet? Or, you know, what's the conversation been? That invites the conversation, okay? But it really is not about the big, grand gesture. Lots of little things, lots of little things add up to a gender inclusive space. And kids notice, the families of, of kids who are non-binary and transgender will absolutely notice. And it's just the raw materials that allows this work to actually go on and on because it's not suddenly dependent on Chuck or the biology teacher or the, the GSA advisor. When they leave, there it goes. It's part of the fabric. Lastly, I want to leave you with one of my favorite quotes in the world. In times of drastic change, it is the learners who inherit the future. The learned usually find themselves beautifully equipped to live in a world that no longer exists. Eric Hoffer. And I would submit that we are in a time of drastic change in how we're thinking and talking about gender. Gender itself hasn't changed all that much. 
but the conversation has. And the question is, do we want to be learned and living in a world that no longer exists, or to be those learners who are operating from curiosity and wonder and really, really looking to expand your understandings and, and, and be part of that conversation? So I'm going to wrap up because I know it's late and it's Thursday night. Um, I did put on your tables this document. So if you're interested in learning more about gender spectrum, fill it out and, and we will you know, add you to our mailing list. And if you don't, no offense taken. But please, if that is something you're interested in, um, please do. And I guess that's it. So thank you. Um, I appreciate you all coming out.